The first one of these that we did a few weeks ago, um, it was relatively primitive. This is going to be slightly less primitive, but I wouldn't say very sophisticated. So you may see things like my hand going in front by accident. Um, welcome. It is a beautiful morning here in New York City. I'm sorry that for some of you it's late night on a Friday night, and if you're here instead of beginning your weekend, I apologize. We'll figure out better days to do that for a global audience um, next time. And um, special, special shout out to uh, Professor Eileen Wee in Singapore, who's hosting a viewing party uh, for her residents and fellows in her home. Uh, she's hosted birthday parties for me there, and I know that they're having a great time, probably a better time than we are here. Um, so hope you're having a good time. And if you want to take a picture of your party and send it or tweet it or however you want to get it to us, that would be terrific. Oh, look, hearts just started popping up. Okay. So um, also thanks to uh, the three residents here who are really on this, who set this up. Uh, I'm just a tool in their hands while they're experimenting with what you can do teaching pathology on the web. Um, there's Emilio Madrigal. Put your hand in front, Emilio. That's Emilio. Um, Rafat Banan, who you heard. Um, <laughs> he waves over there. And Sham Prajapati. That was the giggle you heard. Um, so uh, you may see them all uh, here or there, either on this or future podcasts. Um, we're also aware that the sound was not great on the first one, and so we're using a microphone. Um, if you can't hear, um, uh, tell us, and we'll try and play with it to, to get the sound better. We also realized that there are differences between what's being seen in the phone and the microscope. And so the images from last time were not what, what I was seeing as high power, the viewers were seeing as low power. So we think we figured that out, so uh, we'll adjust. If you have any problems, type it in and, and we'll try to respond. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It is allergy season here in New York City. It's spring. Um, <coughs> uh, Rafat is making, yes, I know, question marks. That's what I was about to say. Um, he's gesturing to me. Um, so questions. So at the, I'm going to show three or four cases. At the end of the, each case, um, we'll have a chance. We'll see how that goes. And then if there's time left over at the end, we can take more questions. And you can type those in. And we'll take the first reasonable questions that come along. Um, uh, though I'll be interested in seeing what kind of unreasonable questions get asked. Um, and then the last thing to mention is um, the title for this, uh, Some Subtleties in Liver Biopsy Interpretation. On the one hand, that's a good all-purpose general title because liver biopsy is very subtle. Um, but in fact, the, cha the cases we're showing got changed around a bit. So some of them are subtle and some of them are not so subtle. Um, but what I want everything, I don't want this to be about special difficult cases, at least not yet. Maybe in future sessions we'll do things like that. Um, I want to cover basic things that come up in everyday practice, things that I worry about um, or have to deal with when I'm sitting at the scope almost every week, certainly every month at least. Um, we'll also uh, ask you um, to chime in about what topic next. I was thinking about doing um, another one in uh, July on um, primary biliary cholangitis, a disease you might have heard of as primary biliary cirrhosis, PBC. There's been a name change recently. I'll discuss why the name change in that session and um, some new approaches to diagnosing it that we figured out and uh, that I think you'll find really useful. So that's my suggestion for a topic. But if you have other topics that you really would like me to talk about and show cases about, we can do that too. So send emails about that if you want. <coughs> okay. So the first case I'm going to show you, um, this is one of my favorite kinds of cases because you don't really see it talked about in textbooks very much. And, um, but it turns out to be very practical. I see a case like this, I'd say, once every two or three months. And that's not a lot, but for the person whose biopsy you're getting, uh, it's tremendous. And this is actually uh, a subtlety. So we'll move. Um, we can keep it here. So oh, yeah, let's put my face back for a moment. And then I can watch this while I'm doing this, and we don't need to change it to there till I want to use it. 
Okay, so me again. Hi. Um, so this is the slide we're looking at. So as I said last time, the, the practice of liver pathology, because pathology in the liver is about subtle changes, and even if the changes are dramatic, um, the subtleties you look for to decide whether something is an autoimmune process as opposed to a viral process or something like that, um, that can be very subtle. Um, so we generally look at a biopsy uh, when we're doing real clinical work without the clinical history first. And for some of these cases, I'm going to do that. For some of these cases, I'm not. I'm going to just start off by uh, teaching you didactically or talking about the case before we look at the slide. But this one, um, I'm not going to. We're just going to go straight to the slide. So. The viewer came loose, so we're reconnecting that to make sure you have an image. Okay, and can we... Okay, so I think you can see the arrow. So I may use the arrow. Good, that works. Can we bring the light up on that a bit? Okay. We're working on it. Okay, so here's the low power view. I'm going to scan over it. So this is us and the learning curve. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Okay, so here we've got a biopsy, and you can see there's a portal tract right here in the middle. And then you come along and there's another portal tract. There's a nice bile duct creeping up there. There's not a lot going on in this biopsy. But at low power, it's looking pretty unimpressive. Here we have a portal tract. And we have parenchyma. There's not inflammation. There's a tiny bit of fat around the central vein here. Bile duct. Maybe that's an artery there. Um, sometimes you don't get the artery or sometimes you don't get the bile duct in the smaller portal tracts. Um, look up a paper by Jim Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D, and his wife Alita. It's a beautiful um, H&E and trichrome analysis of what portal tracts and bile ducts and ductules and canals of herring look like um, in normal liver biopsies. And so you learn to appreciate the variability in normal. Um, if you were to Google Crawford... And uh, what word would be good? Probably just Crawford and trichrome. I bet it would come up. It was in hepatology in the late 90s. So basically, this is kind of an unimpressive biopsy by H&E. One thing you notice... is that there are a lot of binucleated hepatocytes and hepatocytes that are kind of small. So there's been some regeneration here, it looks like. So maybe there's been some hepatocyte injury. And then very subtly on the H&E, you see that there are some silvery gray cells in the sinusoids. And those are macrophages. Those are ceroid-laden macrophages or pigment-laden macrophages. And if we look around on H&E, we may find more of them. And that's a sign that there's been some injury and now there's cleanup. Here's so that's not a lot. There's a little bit of regeneration. 
And there are these pigment-laden macrophages scattered around that you can see by H&E, but you have to really hunt for these changes. They're not really that uh, clear. But one of the special stains that we get on every liver biopsy is the PASD stain. Um, anyone in the residence room with me here know why we get the PASD stain on every liver biopsy? What are we screening for? Alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Yeah, Rifat always knows the answer. Alpha 1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency. So that's a routine stain. But the likelihood of it being useful for that on any given stain, depending on your population, is pretty small. In the European 40 liver biopsies to have that sort of change. <coughs> um, so routinely, it's not really an impressive stain. But it's useful for some other things. If we talk about PBC next time, we'll talk about the use of PASD and PBC. Um, but in this case, and I'll show you why, and it gives you the diagnosis. So with the PASD stain, you see these pigment-laden macrophages are now standing out, and they're all over the place. And in some places, you'll see them happening in little clusters, like here. And here. So these clustered pigment-laden macrophages indicate that there's been recent injury, recent hepatocyte injury. And these macrophages are how the injury has been cleaned up. And on top of it, we see that little bit of regenerative change, indicating that, yeah, there probably has been some hepatocyte loss, and other hepatocytes have had to divide to regenerate and replace that parenchyma. So what we have here, we don't see any ongoing inflammation. We don't see any um, uh, dying hepatocytes. We see no acidophil bodies. All we see is a little hepatocyte regeneration and evidence that there had been hepatocyte injury. So this is what I typically call um, features of resolving acute or subacute hepatitis. Okay? There has been an acute hepatitis. There is no acute hepatitis or chronic hepatitis going on now. So it's a resolved acute hepatitis. And usually when I have these cases, um, the, usually they're biopsies from people who are otherwise healthy, have no known history of liver disease, have no family history of liver disease, but have had abnormal serum transaminase elevations, ALT and AST, um, for months. And once that happens more than six months, that theoretically means chronic liver disease. And so they come for a biopsy. They're known to be hepatitis uh, A, B, C, D, E negative. Um, they have no autoimmune markers. Um, they have nothing. Uh, to explain their abnormal liver tests, and that's why they come for a biopsy. I see this, and I say, you know, my guess is that they had some sort of nonspecific hepatitis um, six months ago, or however long ago the abnormal test started, and, um, and we're never probably going to find out what that is. It might have been some nonspecific viral infection. It might have been some exposure to a toxin. Maybe they took some vitamins or something, or maybe they were on a trip somewhere and got exposed to a toxin in the environment. So why are the numbers still up? Well, this is one of the things about, actually, maybe we should have my face talking again. Um, there I am again. So, <laughs> so I call the clinician and they go, well, what do I tell the patient? What you tell the patient is, you had some hepatitis, it's gone, and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have chronic liver disease. The patient might say, well, why are my numbers still up if I'm, if I'm healthy? This is one of the weird things. So we generally think about ALT and AST as indicating that there is active hepatitic injury in the liver at that time. But we know in a variety of settings that, in fact, ALT and AST don't match what we're seeing on the histology. Classically, hepatitis C, we know that the degree of elevation of ALT, AST in the, um, in the serum does not correlate with how much necroinflammatory activity we see in the biopsy. This is another example. Um, I personally had a drug-induced hepatitis. This was about five years ago. I was put on an antibiotic. Um, within two days, I got really nauseous. I turned yellow. I lost weight. Um, people thought I went on vacation because I lost weight and got a little color and looked really terrific, but, um, which was useful, but, but other than that, it was kind of awful. I got better within two weeks. Um, my 
serum transaminases went as high initially as about 350. They didn't resolve back to normal for two years. So what I tell the clinicians at this point is go back and look at all the serum tests that you've done and actually graph them. Don't look and see that they're elevated, but they look like they're bouncing around. Often what happens when they graph them, they see that in fact, while there's variability, it is trending downwards. And it may take a year or two years for no to normalize. So the diagnosis here, based on what looks on H&E like a virtually normal liver, but you see a little regeneration, you see some macrophages that are sort of silvery gray on H&E, you're going to look at the PASD stain anyways because you have it, or you should have it. And I think this is a more important, more common reason to get the PASD stain, actually, so you avoid missing this. And, um, and you'll see those pigment-laden macrophages, and there's your diagnosis. Features of resolving acute or subacute hepatitis. Okay? Is there a question? Very clear. Okay, no questions. Wow. Um, all right, so we'll go on to the next case. Oh, wait, I didn't actually tell you what the history was. <laughs> so this was a 38-year-old man who, in July 2015, this was a biopsy from uh, this past February, in July 2015, had joint pain, took some Motrin, serum transaminases rose shortly after that and persisted, ranging between 50 and 70. Normal in our system is around 45, upper limit. Slightly low ceruloplasma, but no other tests indicative of Wilson disease. Viral and autoimmune serology is negative. Many herbals and supplements, but none coincident with this rise in serum transaminases. Cialis used for a year and a half prior to the LFT elevations, but had stopped two months before the biopsy. So the patient actually came to look at this biopsy with me because he wanted to understand how he could have abnormal tests and have a near normal liver. Um, and he was very neurotic. And it turned out what he was most concerned about was, is it possible that the Cialis was the cause of this? And could he risk trying Cialis again? And I said to him, I didn't know he should talk to his physician about that, um, that if he does try it again, he should be monitored very carefully. Because I can't exclude the possibility that this was an atypical reaction to the Cialis, um, an idiosyncratic drug reaction. And if you have such a thing, and then you reintroduce the same drug later, it could be far worse. So is there a risk for him? We don't have a definitive answer on this. Um, and it depends how important using Cialis is for him. So that was an interesting uh, clinical dilemma. And one of the rare times I get to sit with the patient looking at their liver biopsy with them. So. Uh, next case. Um, all right, so for this next case, I'm going to show a little bit of PowerPoint first. I, it's three feet away. I can't see it without my glasses. Okay, now, so when we talk about hepatitis, um, most hepatitic things, certainly drug or toxin and virus, to some extent autoimmune too, there's an initiating period where you have uh, an acute phase of injury and you either recover, oh yeah, you can see my hand, good, <laughs> um, or you die or get a transplant if it's really, really, really severe. Um, some percentage of them, depending on what the disease is, goes on to chronic hepatitis. Virtually all of autoimmune hepatitis is this pathway, and, and this part sort of exists, but it's already really just a very active chronic hepatitis. Um, hepatitis B, 10% may go here. Uh, hepatitis C, you know, 90 to 95% um, will go here. So it's dependent on cause. And in the last 20 years, we've moved to a system where we grade the activity of necroinflammation, so the inflammation in the portal tracts and in the lobule and how much hepatocyte injury there is, and we stage the degree of scarring. And for deciding who gets treated, the staging of progression has been the most important. 
though all of this now becomes much less important in the era of successful anti-hepatitis C and anti-hepatitis B treatments. And so everyone's getting treated, so we don't need to do these screening biopsies to stage the disease. But that's, this is typically how we've thought about it. Um, in terms of the grade of activity, there have been four components that we look at. There's the degree of inflammation in the portal tract, interface hepatitis, what used to be called piecemeal necrosis, at the interface of the stroma of the portal tracts or septa if they're there, and the parenchyma, so right at that edge. Lobular hepatitis, um, dying hepatocytes, inflammation out in the parenchyma, and then confluent necrosis, which is the hallmark of severe injury. If you look at any of the grading and staging schemes, really to become severe um, in any of them, you need to see some degree of confluent necrosis. And this is most clear in the ISHAC grading and staging scheme, the six-point uh, scheme. And it's confluent necrosis I want to focus on here. So by confluent necrosis, we mean uh, something like this. Here's the portal tracts with a chronic inflammatory infiltrate. So that defines it as a chronic hepatitis. And around the central vein, there's a zone of dropout of hepatocytes. And if that becomes, and that's what we call confluent necrosis. If it becomes more severe, then you get bridging confluent necrosis, or just bridging necrosis. Um, sometimes it'll look like it's portal portal, and you may not see the central vein in the middle, but usually if you do deeper levels, you'll actually find it somewhere in there. So it's connecting structures like this. And if it's really bad, you get total parenchymal collapse. And if the whole liver looks like this, that's someone who obviously needs a transplant tomorrow, if not yesterday. Um, so this is confluent necrosis. Any degree of confluent necrosis is severe activity in a chronic hepatitis, okay? So this is what it looks like. Here's a central vein. Here are hepatocytes coming in, and then they stop, and there's this confluent necrotic zone made up of some collagen fibers that are depositing, plus the, the reticulin fibers that used to be there of the normal structure. We've got pigment-laden macrophages again, just like that in other case. Um, in there, we only have the pigment-laden macrophages because the injury was, was gone, um, and that takes the longest to depart. But here, where we've got the active necrosis, you can see the macrophages doing their job. And in this case, there are collections of plasma cells because this is actually a case of autoimmune hepatitis. And that would be a hint. Uh, question to people in the room. If I don't see plasma cells, does that rule out autoimmune hepatitis? There are shaking heads here. I'm going to assume that's because they know the answer is no rather than they don't know the answer and they can't believe I asked them a question. Um, plasma cells, if you see them and you think the patient has autoimmune hepatitis clinically, great. That supports the diagnosis. Their absence, however, does not go against the diagnosis. In my experience, about 50%, 40 to 50% of autoimmune hepatitis cases demonstrated clinically don't have tremendous numbers of plasma cells in the biopsy. Um, so that's confluent necrosis around a central vein. This is bridging necrosis in a liver biopsy. Um, this was uh, a case of um, also of autoimmune hepatitis. And uh, this is a trichrome stain. And you can see the normal baseline scarring, not scarring, the stroma of the normal portal tracts. And between them, you've got these zones of confluent necrosis. And there is a little bit of blue staining because you do get a little bit of very early collagen deposition. This is probably weeks old, no more than that. You see a ductular reaction in here. We know that that's an attempt by the stem cell compartment to activate. It's usually not very helpful in this kind of situation to restore the liver. And you can see how with this kind of injury, if this goes untreated, very rapidly this in fact will scar down and it'll go straight from an acute presentation of severe injury directly to cirrhosis in weeks to months to maybe a year or two, as opposed to let's say chronic hepatitis C, which percolates on with low degrees of injury and becomes cirrhotic over 10, 20, or 30 years. This w could transition directly to cirrhosis. And that's autoimmune hepatitis um, can often do that. That's why autoimmune hepatitis is often picked up late stage, because this early stage is missed clinically. They're asymptomatic, but this goes straight to scarring. Um, so this is bridging necrosis. Um, if you have a case that's virus negative, um, 
what you know the patient doesn't have hepatitis C, you know the patient doesn't have hepatitis B, but it looks like chronic hepatitis, there's portal inflammation, and you have confluent necrosis, what's your differential diagnosis? The differential really comes down to primarily these three things. Autoimmune hepatitis, drug toxin-induced liver injury, DILI. Um, and I say, as always, because anything you ever see in a liver biopsy can ca be caused by a drug or a toxin somewhere in someone, whether it's neoplasia, whether it's inflammation, whether it's regeneration. There's some toxin that will cause it in someone somewhere, predictably or idiosyncratically. But so that's always on your differential diagnosis, no matter what you see on a liver biopsy. And then Wilson disease can present with an acute fulminant picture like this. There are much rarer diseases, um, metabolic diseases, more often in children than in adults that can do this. Um, so if these are excluded, then you've got to dig far deeper. But this is the main differential. Um, and then what I want to emphasize about autoimmune hepatitis is, as I hinted at, it's not the same progression as chronic viral hepatitis, okay? So with, let's say, hepatitis C or hepatitis B, you have varying activity over time. Occasionally you have an acute flare, but it just sort of percolates along year after year after year. And some patients we know will develop scarring fairly quickly, maybe in as little as five years, to progress to late-stage liver disease, cirrhosis. Some don't ever get to late-stage liver disease. They may have some mild degree of fibrosis, but they're never going to become, have an end-stage liver. They're not going to die of their liver disease. And then there are some that are intermediate and take 10 or 20 years to develop. And the difference between these three patients, we really don't understand why. And, you know, people talk about genetic polymorphisms that make you at risk for rapid scarring as opposed to slower scarring, but we don't really know. And now with the antiviral treatments, they should all be treated and cured, so um, that shouldn't matter for the vast majority of patients anymore. Autoimmune hepatitis does something like this. It's a very different picture. You have a very severe wave of activity that happens very early, weeks, months, a couple of years, and then it gradually goes to a burned out stage where you just don't have a lot of activity. And as I showed you in that bridging necrosis slide, this severe injury can directly scar and go directly into a cirrhotic picture. And so historically, when this di disease was first being diagnosed, for example, at the Royal Free Hospital in London, where I studied um, with Dame Sheila Sherlock and Peter Scheuer, the initial uh, cases that were presented were primarily middle-aged to little old ladies who had abnormal liver tests or not, but they presented suddenly with features of end-stage liver disease, like ascites, and they'd had no history of being ill. And when they did biopsies, they found that you had cirrhosis with a little bit of activity or pretty burned out. And then they put it together that these patients all had autoimmune antibodies, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-mitochondrial, anti-smooth muscle antibodies. The plasma cells were identified. And the disease autoimmune hepatitis was established as a disease entity that could be treated with corticosteroids. Then, having established the disease, they started getting smart and started seeing patients who had abnormal liver tests. They were not advanced stage liver disease, but they also had autoantibodies because they were now looking for autoantibodies. And they started picking up these patients who had a lot of activity to a moderate degree of activity, a moderate degree of scarring to severe scarring. So somewhere earlier, but they either had significant activity or significant scarring or both. And that was this category. With increasing subtlety of diagnosis, um, we now see patients in this category, often much younger women, sometimes men, um, who come in with abnormal uh, elevated serum transaminases, usually hundreds, maybe even thousands. They look like acute hepatitis. They do viral markers and autoimmune markers, and they find out they're ANA positive, anti-smooth muscle positive. They do a biopsy, and there's very little in the way of scarring, but there's tremendous activity. And so this is a very frequent presentation now for autoimmune hepatitis. And if you treat here and get them to be quiet here, they will not go on to late stage liver disease. So this is a way to suppress or even cure in some patients autoimmune hepatitis. Notice that the chance of getting a biopsy in autoimmune hepatitis down here with minimal inflammation and minimal scarring is almost zero. So sometimes what happens is you'll get a liver biopsy 
and the patient has anti-nuclear antibody positive, mildly elevated LFTs, they're thinking autoimmune hepatitis, and it would look like what we used to see on hep C, maybe a little portal tract scarring or not much, a little interface hepatitis, a few scattered uh, acidophil bodies, very mild injury. And you might say, well, it's hepatitis, and they're autoantibody positive, it must be autoimmune hepatitis. And then they're going to put the patient on steroids. Mm -mm -mm. That's more likely to be some nonspecific acute hepatitis that has no bearing on this patient's well-being, and you don't want to put them on steroids. So don't over-diagnose very, very early, very, very mild autoimmune hepatitis simply because a patient has an antinuclear antibody. Um, they might have a little bit of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or they might just have autoantibodies with no known associated disease. So this is important stuff to know. Um, and that brings us to the case. I'm going to tell you the clinical history just to, because I've already talked so much on this one. Um, this is a 49 year old woman who presents with what looks like acute hepatitis. She's uh, jaundiced, she's nauseous, she's vomiting, and her serum liver tests um, are very high uh, 800, 900. And they do viral serologies, and they're all negative and they do autoantibodies, and she's anti-nuclear antibody positive. And she also has a mild elevation of uh, IgG in her serum. And so this is rule out autoimmune hepatitis, and it sounds very much like it could be an autoimmune hepatitis. And I'm gonna start with the trichrome stain. And you can see it's a variably distorted, but very distorted liver. So blue is the portal tracts, the normal stroma, and this is a really beautiful example here of parenchymal collapse. Portal tract with bile duct, artery, portal vein, bile duct, artery, portal vein. Maybe there's some mild fibrosis, but this is a 49-year-old woman, so she might have a little bit increased stroma anyways, age-related. So, but, you know, could be some mild fibrosis. Um, and in between, you can see there's a bit of a ductular reaction, stem cell response. There's not much in the way of inflammation, there's not much in the way of scarring, and there's the central vein caught between the two portal tracts and all the hepatocytes are gone. So this is parenchymal collapse. This is severe confluent necrosis. So already we know now this patient has chronic hepatitis with severe confluent necrosis. What's the differential diagnosis? Virus negative, it's not hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. Um, and the autoantibodies are positive. It's autoimmune hepatitis. Are we sure of that? Well, it could still be drug or toxin mediated um, because sometimes drugs and toxins can cause an autoimmune hepatitis. Um, if we look around on the H&E, here's some ductular reaction again. And there are plasma cells floating around see if we can show you these. Oh, look, here's some plasma cell pus, I like to call it. Maybe a little higher. Nope, that's, that's as high as we can go. At the tip of the arrow, I don't know if you can make it out. It, that aggregate, that ball of cells is nothing but plasma cells. Yeah, there you can see it. Um, oh, someone said that's good. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean it's autoimmune hepatitis? It sounds like autoimmune hepatitis, but let's say they told you that this patient three months ago started on um, isoniazid for tuberculosis. This could be isoniazid toxicity. Um, so can you ever be sure there wasn't a drug or toxin exposure? Eh, it's tricky. This is where you have to talk to your clinicians. This is where liver pathology isn't like, let's say, luminal GI pathology, where if you say something's a tubular adenoma, no conversation ever has to follow. This you need to get on the phone and say, well, what really is going on with this patient? 
Um, what's the treatment? It's still immunosuppressive therapy. This is someone with active disease. If they aren't treated now, all of this is going to scar down. So whether it's drug-related, toxin-related, or just de novo autoimmune hepatitis, this needs to be treated. And in general, they'll all respond. If they don't respond, and I've rarely seen that, but classic autoimmune hepatitis-like picture, but they don't respond at all, that's probably a drug or toxin. And there was one case I remember very clearly. This was about eight years ago. This guy from um, upstate New York, um, Woodstock, New York. You've all heard of Woodstock, where the big music festival was. It still is sort of like hippie central, left over from the 60s. And this guy grew uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms on his farm. And, uh, oh, hi, there you are. And um, finally convinced him to stop. He stopped using his mushrooms. His numbers got a little bit better, but they didn't resolve. Got a liver biopsy, looked exactly like this, treated him, did not respond to treatment. And he was no longer using, and his wife was paying attention, and she said he's not taking anything. Um, and he didn't respond to the drugs, uh, the, the immunosuppressive therapy, and went on to get a liver transplant. So um, when drugs are involved, if you get atypical clinical situations, that may hint that it's actually drug, not autoimmune hepatitis. Now, last question on this case, two questions. Let's say the patient had hepatitis B. What's the diagnosis? Does anyone want to, uh... well, question number one, could it still be autoimmune hepatitis or drug toxicity? I'm looking for you in the audience out there around the planet. Eileen, what are your residents saying? Anyone typing? Yes. How did I phrase the question? What does yes mean? Now I'm confused. Um, yes, it could be autoimmune or drug toxicity. You know, when you have places where viruses are epidemic or endemic, then sure, autoimmune hepatitis is going to happen in some of those patients. Um, so you have to exclude that possibility, whether it's hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis C. What else would you have to worry about, though, if you know the patient has hepatitis B? From Professor Wee. <laughs> You can't answer, Eileen. Well, if you've got hepatitis B, you could be at that moment where you're going from hepatitis B antigen to E antibody in the serum, and you often have an acute phase of injury. It's not usually going to show up this severe, but it could theoretically. The other more important thing you have to worry about is um, co-infection with Delta hepatitis. So you have a chronic hepatitis B, and then you get Delta, you could easily go into liver failure like this um, with, with very severe injury. Um, you also have to worry about immune suppression, in particular HIV infection, newly acquired or longstanding. Um, often you can get uh, much more severe activity in hepatitis B from that. If you have hepatitis C, the things to worry about are also HIV. Um, it could be just an acute flare, but usually not this severe autoimmune hepatitis, drug toxicity. So if you seek influent necrosis in a chronic hepatitis biopsy, even if it's autoimmune hepatitis, you need to describe this for the clinician and you need to point out to them, this may be simply the course of this patient's viral infection, B or C, but you have to worry about immune suppression, HIV particularly, autoimmune hepatitis, or a drug toxin induced injury. Even with so many plasma cells, someone's asking about plasma cells. The drug or toxin injury is going to point to, and AIH could be plasma cells. With HIV, probably not so much. Um, but you need to worry about clinicians, otherwise the clinician may, mi may miss a treatable liver disease. And in this case, it's a very severe liver disease. Okay? Any questions on all of that? One question. Everyone's so quiet. There's a pitiful. Oh, there's a bit of a lag, I'm told. But there's a bit of a lag in me talking to them, too. So, oh. We'll give it a moment. OK. Any questions in the room? What about um, autoantibodies in this patient? Do you have any info about that? Yeah, uh, Rifat asked if we have autoantibodies in this patient. They had both anti-nuclear antibodies and serum IgG elevated. Mm -hmm. So that means it would fit with autoimmune so I would favor autoimmune hepatitis, but that doesn't mean they don't have drug-induced injury because that can sometimes trigger an autoimmune hepatitis. So, but either way, they're treated the same way. It should be treated clinically like an autoimmune hepatitis. What would be your final diagnosis? 
Final diagnosis would be chronic hepatitis with severe, uh, with marked activity, parentheses, parenchymal collapse, close parentheses, um, with mild portal fibrosis. Maybe, I'd have to dither about that. Um, but clearly early, uh, suggestive of autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, see comment. <laughs> and then in the comment, I'd say, while features are all compatible with autoimmune hepatitis and a clinical picture, um, care should be taken to exclude drug toxin mediated injury. And I say drug and toxin because it's not just drug. Um, someone typed in, it can be very difficult to distinguish, uh, it just faded. I was not quick, really quickly. I'm sorry I missed your question. Um, but that was the question anyway. Uh, one quick case and one slightly less quick case. And this is a liver tumor in hepatocellular carcinoma. Things that look like hepatocytes growing in very thickened cords. They have endothelial cells plastered on the surface of the tumor cells. So these are not like a capillarized, um, these are not like a normal sinusoidal endothelium where there is no basement membrane and there's the space of DISA between the endothelial cells and the hepatocytes. In a normal liver, the endothelial cells and the sinusoids are negative for CD34. These cells would be positive for CD34, so that can be a helpful marker if you've got things that look like well-differentiated cells and you see these endothelial cells plastered on, that suggests um, a carcinoma. It would be supportive of that. You see pseudo-gland formation. This is an attempt. It's not really a gland. It's an attempt at tumor hepatocytes to create a bile canaliculus, and there's even a little bile pigment inside it. And then the plates are very thick. So the liver, these malignant hepatocytes are trying to build normal liver architecture, but they're unable to. So the diagnosis here is pretty straightforward, and you really wouldn't need any special stains, you know, particularly given that this is a patient with hepatitis C, and there are no masses outside the liver, this is HCC till proven otherwise. The reason I want to show it to you is because I want to discuss the special stains we use. If you're not sure you have a tumor that is hepatocellular, um, but it looks hepatocellular like this, outside the liver, a patient who has no known history of liver disease, and you want to prove that it's hepatocellular, we've got a bunch of markers. The one people are most aware of, I think, normal hepatocytes and malignant hepatocytes the same way. You're looking at very granular stippled cytoplasmic staining. This is staining actually a, um, uh, a part of the urea cycle, an enzyme in the urea cycle that is present in the mitochondria. So what you're staining here are the mitochondria in the hepatocytes. And so this proves that this is hepatocellular. The only other cell in the body that, um, besides something that has hepatocellular differentiation, is small intestine. And just a little helpful side hint, if you have a carcinoma where its site of origin is, you can use HEPAR1, and if it turns out to be positive, then you really have to think about small intestinal neuroendocrine tumor as the primary lesion. Um, so that's an interesting thing with HEPAR1. So everyone loves HEPAR1 because it's very clear and very, the pattern is very precise, but it, sometimes it's not positive. Uh, recently, a marker that has been said to be more sensitive than um, HEPAR1 is arginase. And this is a faint arginase stain. I'm not sure I would buy it as being truly positive. And I'll show you, and this, this looks positive here. There look like there are positive nuclei and positive cytoplasmic staining. So that's, that's probably positive. The HEPAR1 is much better. But this already shows you that there's some variability. And because of the original publication on Arginase 1, which said it's so much better than HEPAR1 in terms of sensitivity, people assume that if the, HEP, if the Arginase, if the HEPAR1, uh, that arginase is more likely to be positive than the HEPAR1. But here's a case where the HEPAR1 is much more vivid than the arginase 1. So that already tells you that's not, case by case, that's not always true. Another marker you can use is the polyclonal antibodies to CEA. It's not that you're actually staining CEA, you're staining, there's a specific cross-reaction between the polyclonal anti-CEA antibodies and biliary glycoprotein 1. 
and that's a canalicular membrane protein, and so you get canalicular pattern of staining. Not cytoplasmic, not membranous, where the entire cell is. That could just be CEA. So cytoplasmic and membranous staining doesn't count here. What you want to see are these little twig-like structures between hepatocytes or between tumor cells. That's canalicular staining of polyclonal CA. And to me, this is actually the most commonly positive stain in my experience. The fourth marker is CD10. And the same thing, cytoplasmic or... But if you see canalicular staining, that's diagnostic. So this is a case where all four of these are positive. A fifth stain that has been useful, we don't really know why, TTF1, thyroid transcription factor 1, which we know is positive in thyroid cells and in um, uh, lung epithelium. But it's also in nuclei as a transcription factor. But it also has this punctate HEPPAR1-like mitochondria presumption is that this is a cross-reaction, a specific cross-reaction with a cytoplasmic mitochondrial protein, but we don't know what that is yet. Um, so this can also be useful. So we've got five markers. The reason I'm showing this is I want to emphasize that I always do at least not the TTF1 as well and do all five because there are plenty of cases where only one marker is positive. And while arginase is theoretically more commonly positive than others, I have plenty of cases where it's only the CD10 or only the polyclonal CA or only the HEPAR. Any combination of two markers, any combination of three, any combination of four. So if you have a real issue and you haven't done that whole panel, you really haven't worked up the case yet. Because you may just get a case where four of them are negative and you haven't done the one that would prove that it's an hepatocellular lesion. So I think it's important to do all five. That's my personal practice. Now, I say that to set up this other case, um, which, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is um, a 72-year-old man who presented with right upper quadrant pain and um, a little overweight um, and, uh, you know, pre-diabetic but no overt diabetes, cirrhotic liver by imaging, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it turns out when in the non-tumor liver that got biopsied, he had uh, cirrhosis from uh, NAFL. But the, the liver lesion is particularly interesting. And so the liver lesion looks like this. So here we So there's an adenocarcinoma here. And while we don't normally think of cholangiocarcinoma with fatty liver disease, in fact, fatty liver disease increases the risk for cholangiocarcinoma. So that's not excluded just because he doesn't have some other more typical thing like PSC. However, as we look around, we go from this area into this area, and he's clearly got a well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. So we do a bunch of immunostains. Do we even need to? We could probably make this diagnosis on H&E, but it's fun to do the stains. Here's arginase 1, and it's positive in the hepatocellular component. And maybe focally in a few cells in the cholangio areas, although those cells look more hepatocytic. Here's the HEPAR1, negative. So this is a case where HEPAR1 wasn't the stain. Arginase 1 was the stain. Keratin 19, interestingly, positive in both the cholangio component and the hepatocellular component. And we know that pure HCC that's keratin 19 positive has a worse prognosis. Um, here, we've got a bad tumor. It's got a cholangio component, which is by itself, that's probably what's going to kill the patient. But interestingly, the HCC also expresses keratin-19. Um, the reason I show this case, and this is the last point I'm going to make, is because today, in two hours, I'm submitting a paper. And 
This is the Blue Book, which I was the editor for the, the last edition of the Blue Book from the WHO. I was the editor for the liver section, and I co-wrote the chapter on combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma. And what we said is that there were three subtypes um, that, that showed stem cell features, and we have pictures of these. The typical subtype, intermediate cell subtype, a cholangiolocellular subtype. And we have these as three distinct tumors. Um, we weren't sure the clinical importance of these, but we knew they had been recognized. There were a series of cases of all of these. I was the first one to report the typical subtype. Young Yan Park was really important for intermediate cell. Uh, Mina Kamuta with Tanya Roskams in Belgium put this on the map with a major monumental study. And in, in all of these cases, these were tumors that were mixed tumors, so it deserved to be in this chapter. And tumors had one of these features, so we made three distinct subtypes. There are two problems, at least, with this terminology. Number one, combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma is too many syllables. So we recently had a consensus meeting. There are 33 authors involved. Basically, everyone who has clinically, radiologically, pathologically reported on these tumors who's still alive. Everybody was in the room or online consulting. And we've prepared a document, which I'm submitting today. Um, Nature Reviews Gastroenterology and Hepatology has agreed to see it. We don't know whether they'll accept it. And the new name is hepatocholangiocarcinoma. Still a lot of syllables, but not so many. So we think that's an improvement. HCHC, hepatocholangiocarcinoma. The other thing that's come out since the Blue Book, the Blue Book really spurred a lot of activity researching these things, and we've discovered that, in fact, these subtypes of stem cell features can occur in any combination in tumors and don't always occur in a mixed tumor. So now we have eliminated the diagnostic subtypes. That no longer exists, so we're updating what we say in the Blue Book to eliminate those diagnostic categories because stem cell features may occur within or in any combination. We still think you need to identify them and record them because we don't know what kind of importance they're going to have down the line, but, um, but they are no longer a diagnostic subcategory. And so I wanted to update you that. You're, this is the first public announcement of the new terminology prior to publication, prior to submission. Um, I'm hoping it will be published within the next couple of months. Um, watch for it. And that's it. Any question about staining in HCCs or hepatocholangiocarcinomas? Oh, and Singapore, Dr. Wee is a co-author of that paper, of course. All right, so uh, we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone wants to throw questions. The one that I missed from before, if you want to retype it, that would be fine. While we're dealing with the lag, that's Sham Prajapati. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to ask. Oh, Glipican 3. Someone wants to ask me about Glipican 3. Thank you. I forgot to mention that. Glipican 3 to me is not an hepatocyte marker. If it's the only one that's positive and all the other hepatocyte markers are negative, how do you know it's not some other malignancy that's expressing Glipican 3? If you have any of the other markers positive, you don't need glipocan 3 because you've got the other markers. Where glipocan 3 is useful is if you have something that's clearly an hepatocyte, but you don't know if it's malignant or not. Let's say you've got a mass lesion and you've got hepatocytes. Could it be adenoma or HCC and you're not sure with the sample that you have? If the glipocan 3 is positive, you better start thinking about HCC or really, uh, or beta-catenin mutated hepatocellular adenoma. Um, so I don't use it as an hepatocyte marker. I use it if you have something that you know is an hepatocyte, but is it malignant or benign, um, then I use glipocan 3. Any other questions? So we need to, questions come quickly and then disappear. So we need someone to record questions as they appear so and, uh, I can... The last question was, um, any tips for collapse versus fibrosis? For oh, trichrome? any tips for collapse versus fibrosis um, in the trichrome stain? Well, th this is the, the, the thing. The collapse, you just see portal tracks next to each other. Um, so 
there's nothing to scar. There's just collapse. Um, if you see parenchyma separating the structures and then you see fibrosis traversing that, uh, you see stroma traversing that, then that's scar. A portal tract itself being scarred, as you can see in that case, was that baseline stroma or is it a little portal fibrosis? It doesn't really matter because it's still early stage. My suspicion is in the next five years, we're going to go from having four or five or six point staging systems for, for fibrosis down to early versus late. I have a feeling that's where we're headed. Um, so mild fibrosis versus no fibrosis, an occasional fiber septum. I'm, I'm not so worried about how precise I get with that. Okay, I think we're done. Um, to those of you who stayed up late and uh, ruined the beginning of your weekend, thank you for your company. And um, the rest of you, I hope the, your Friday isn't too fraught with too much work and you get out early. Thank you very much. Bye from New York.